Hi, I'm Bill Hurt, the current chairman of the Quad City Woodturners. This is the next video in our series for the beginning woodturner. Today we're going to talk about tools and uh, the different types of tools and how to use those various tools and some examples of each. Oftentimes during uh, our discussion about wood turning, we talk about, you'll hear the phrases uh, spindle turning or end grain turning, or you'll also hear it referred, uh, the opposite being referred to as side grain or face grain turning. It's really important to know which one you're dealing with because the wood cuts differently um, depending on the orientation. Anyone who's ran a board through a table saw um, in a cross-cut fashion, you know, with the blade coming across this way uh, versus running it through lengthwise, we'll understand that the fibers that come off of that wood are actually uh, shaped differently and, it, and you feel it cut differently and you can have problems on a table saw with things like tear out or that uh, fraying that you'll get along the edge of the wood. The same thing is true in wood turning. So when we talk about spindle turning, it's really easy, I think, for people to look at this piece of wood and understand that the, the grain runs lengthwise and, uh, and this would be something that we would make a spindle type turning, whether that would be um, a pin blank or, or a stair piece or, or whatever. Out of that, we know that the grain is running, running that way. Similarly, if we looked at a board, um, like this, we can tell that the grain is running in this direction. Now, it certainly is possible to have a wide board and to cut off a piece and have the grain going the other direction, but when you look at the end grain here, um, you can tell that that's the direction that we're running. So the, the reason that that's really important in wood turning is because if you use a spindle roughing gouge um, on a side grain piece, you're probably going to get yourself a nasty catch. You might get hurt and you might break your tool. So it's important to know what you're dealing with. It also affects the way uh, that you sand that piece and that the uh, finished product comes out. Now, when you look at a piece of wood like this one, uh, this was cut at a sawmill, um, cut by someone else that's been sitting in my shop now for a couple of years. Um, and I happen to know that this piece of wood is probably 25 or 30 years old. At some point, somebody coated the end grain here around the end um, with wax. So that's kind of an easy way for me to know that that's the end grain. So that means that the grain is running in this direction. But if, I, if uh, it wasn't coated with wax, I would have to look at it and feel the, the grain of the wood because this is just a it's really a rough block of wood and it's not immediately apparent which direction the grain is going because if you were to look at the saw marks that are on this piece of wood, you might think that the grain was going that way, but actually um, it is running this way across there. And so it's important to know. It's not that you can't mount this piece of wood any way that you want in the lathe. You just have to know which direction the grain is going so that you approach it correctly. You could certainly mount this piece of wood between centers and make a small bowl out of it. And as we would see this coming around, where I've marked the end grain with the white chalk here, then we know that we're turning side grain because the end grain is coming around towards us. But I don't know why you'd want to do this, but you could mount the, the piece of wood this way. And then even though this doesn't look like a piece of, of what we would normally call a spindle, that is in spindle orientation and then it affects the tools that you can use. So uh, we'll mount these up in the lathe later and give you an example of that as it's spinning on the lathe, but that is an important topic to cover and is something that you always need to be considering as a, as a wood turner when you mount that in the lathe. When we talk about our types of tools for wood turning, typically we put them into a couple of different categories. The first would be what I have on the table here, and those would be carbide tools. Those are generally easier to use, especially for a new person. 
However, they have some limitations uh, regarding sharpness and uh, just the uh, overall versatility of the tool, I guess. Um, if you go out and buy yourself a set of carbide tools, typically it'll be a, uh, it may be handled or unhandled and it may have uh, removable uh, tips, if you will, like this set does. Uh, within your carbide tools, you're going to end up with a, uh, a round tool, which is your general purpose tool. Uh, they call them by different things, such as a, um, a finisher or a detail tool, that type of thing. This would be a general purpose tool, and uh, you're going to have something like that, which will be round. You're going to have one like this that has a square tip uh, on the end of it. And uh, while we have this, this shot up here, something to note about your carbide tools is the carbide is very similar to what you would have on a uh, table saw blade or another uh, tool with a carbide tip. And that, that is a very brittle tool. And uh, as you can see, there's a damage there to the top of this one just uh, from it banging around in the drawer with uh, a couple of other tools. I don't store them that way anymore. I store them separately to prevent that from happening. But that's one thing you need to know about a uh, carbide tool. And then there'll also be a tool like this, which is a, uh, a detail gouge or, or a uh, detail tool that you can get in and do some fine work with. Right. So an, another feature with carbide tools is these tips are typically replaceable. They'll have like a Torx head screw like this one. Uh, so that you can replace those tips as needed. These tips run anywhere from a few dollars to maybe uh, $15 or $20, depending on where you're buying them and if they match your tool or not. Um, one other feature that I'd like to point out on this particular set, and this doesn't exist on all of them, is uh, the angle on the back of the tool here is set up so that you can present the tool flat to the work, which you would do most of the time. But uh, I'll give you this round one because this is more of an example of where you would use this. Um, you can, it has a flat spot on the edge so that if you were to shear scrape um, or use it in that fashion, it's kind of set up for the beginner to do that uh, more easily. Um, with this setup here, and uh, again, not all uh, carbide tools are removable like this from the handle. But this one comes with a heavy duty um, handle that really has some heft to it and uh, is able to dampen the vibrations. It's got a foam uh, sleeve on it and, it and that also dampens the vibration. And it's just really a, simply a matter of uh, dropping your tool in there and securing that and, and you're good to go. Um, and then to replace it, you just loosen it up and you drop your next one in. So if you're considering carbide tools, um, that's a little bit of information about those. Um, the next, next type of uh, tool that we'll talk about are the steel tools. And when you're looking at steel tools, basically there's um, three varieties out there that are common in wood turning the first being what we call an m2 steel that's Evans and mary the next would be a m42 steel and then there's also what we would call powdered metal tools which are typically referred to either as a-11 or cpm 10v and so the difference between those uh, steels is that some of them are harder than others and the way that they retain sharpness. The, the other difference, big difference, is the cost to produce them. So for most new wood turners, you're going to start off with an M2 steel just because it's uh, the most economical choice out of those. And uh, when we talk about M2 steel, and uh, remember that I'm not a, a metallurgist or a tool expert by any means, but when we talk about M2 steel, that's commonly what you see um, in your regular drill bits that you would pick up at the hardware store. Um, it's a tool that maintains a good edge. It sharpens fairly easily, uh, and it's just a good all-around choice uh, for wood turning. These uh, tools that are on the table here are an example of M2 steel. 
Um, if you start off with a less expensive tool that would, you would get in a kit, and we'll talk about a kit versus individual tools later on in this video, um, you're probably going to have M2 uh, steel for that. Um, to buy these in a kit, uh, you're going to pay probably around $100 and get several tools in that kit. Um, if you're going to buy an individual uh, tool that's M2 steel, such as this spindle gouge, with a handle on it, you'll probably pay somewhere between 40 to maybe 70 or $80 per individual tool. Uh, this tool right here is a, a Hurricane brand. I think you can find that on Amazon most easily. They're an M2 steel. They're, they're of a pretty decent quality and at a pretty decent price. So that's your M2 steel. Uh, next, we'll talk a little bit about the M42 and then we'll move on to the powdered metal. So the next type of metal that we're, we're talking about are uh, the M42, uh, which is similar to the M2, except it's added more cobalt, I believe, is the uh, type of metal that gets added. And that makes the tool a lot tougher. It dulls slower. Um, it's it's uh, something that will maintain its sharpness longer. And you can really put a, a fine edge on these just like you can with the M2 steel but you're going to be taking less trips over to the grinder. The, the main difference between them besides the material is the cost that's involved. Um, this particular tool right here was, um, if I remember correctly, right around $100 just for the piece of steel. And then you would either have to have a handle system or um, make your own handle for it. And I do believe that every good wood turner should make at least one handle for his tools just to see the process that's involved. Um, so that's M42 steel. You're going to pay more for that, but it's going to last uh, quite a bit longer. And um, it may not necessarily be the tool you should start off with just because of the cost and um, the amount of time that you're going to take learning to sharpen it. You're going to be sharpening away some good steel. The next metal that we're going to talk about here is often referred to as powdered metal or uh, CPM10V or A11. It all kind of means the same thing. This uh, particular metal is actually starts off in a powdered form where the ingredients are kind of combined and uh, it forms the, the steel bar. Uh, that vanadium that is in there, which I believe is what that uh, V stands for, it, it gives that tool an extra toughness. Out of the, the three steel tools that we talked about, the M2, the M42, um, and this powdered metal. Powdered metal, I think, is probably the toughest. Um, the drawback to powdered metal, you say, well, why wouldn't I just buy a powdered metal tool and be done with it? The drawback is that uh, it, you can't get it quite as sharp as you can the other two unless you go to a really high grit, like a 600 grit. Uh, stone and uh, for some people that's a problem. Saying that, um, I think if you were to walk up and use your finger to touch this tool uh, right here, this is a, a Doug Thompson tool, it is very sharp. Looking at it under a microscope next to an M42 um, or under some kind of magnification, I think that you would see that maybe it's not quite as sharp, but for the average turner, I don't think you're going to notice a difference. I don't think you could go wrong uh, with a powdered metal or an M42 when you're looking at your long-term tools that you want to invest in. So uh, one of the things that uh, people often ask is, what do I need to start? Um, it, here at the club, we have put together a little kit of essential tools. Uh, so that if we have a new person that walks into the door and wants to try some wood turning, uh, we can just hand them this kit of tools and it's basically what they would need to start. So within that kit, we, we have a parting tool, which is used to um, separate the wood uh, from your mounting system on the chuck. We have a spindle gouge, uh, which we talked a little bit about the spindle orientation in one of our other videos. We have a round nose scraper, and then we have a bowl gouge. And with those uh, four tools, that's really all that you need uh, to get started. So I'll give you a, a better look at each one of those. 
if you were to look at a bowl gouge uh, kind of up close, it has uh, typically a, a deep flute down the middle here, and uh, it's going to have some swept back wings a little bit typically, and that, that tool's job is to basically hollow out the inside of a bowl or hollow out another item. So that's kind of the profile that you would look at uh, when you're looking at a bowl gouge. These gouges are going to come in uh, different sizes and typically from about three eighths, uh, maybe down to a quarter inch, but typically um, three eighths inch thick uh, round bar all the way up to three quarter inch. Uh, conversely here, this is a spindle gouge and as you can see, it's got a um, shallower flute. If you were to look at it on end, um, it's got a shallower flute down, the, down there and that's used for um, spindle work typically and it's going to have a little bit different profile than that bowl gouge, but mainly it's that sharp, uh, shallower flute down the middle that is easiest to tell them apart quickly. Um, this is a round nose scraper, and it's typically a flat bar. Sometimes the end will be squared off, sometimes it'll be rounded, sometimes it'll be shaped to the particular uh, job at hand, but that is uh, presented to the wood differently and it actually scrapes the wood away as it's spinning rather than uh, cutting into it the way that a gouge would. So there's an up close look at that. And then this would be a uh, parting tool and uh, we'll show you an example of how that's used. Uh, this is a pretty thin parting tool. You can get these um, thicker and in various shapes and sizes, but this is uh, a uh, example of a parting tool. One of the questions that we get typically asked is uh, whether or not you should buy a whole set of tools at once or you should buy them individually. Um, I would always recommend to a new turner to buy a cheap set of tools. And I know that's um, sometimes controversial when you talk to other turners. Uh, some people will tell you to uh, the old phrase of uh, cry once, buy once, and uh, buy an expensive tool, and you're not going to buy another one for a long time. Uh, that, that is true, and I would recommend that as you become a more experienced turner, but this set of uh, videos is really geared for that brand new person. And so for that grand, brand new person, I would recommend going out to uh, buy a set that's going to have probably between five to eight tools in it. It's going to be M2 steel. Make sure that it's M2 steel and it's not an older set that was made out of uh, carbon steel. Um, you might as well throw those away if you have them because they're just not going to uh, work out as well for you. But if you walk into a place like Harbor Freight, you could buy a set of cheap tools for under $100. You could go online and buy a set from uh, Amazon. I think Benjamin's Best is a common uh, entry-level tool. Savannah would be another company that makes an entry-level set. And uh, I think Hurricane Tools off of a place like Amazon.com will have um, all of those will have a set that's around $100 that will expose you to between five and eight tools in that set. And then those are going to be a good set to get you started because you can do a variety of tasks with them without outlaying five or $800 in tools. And you'll learn to sharpen those. And if you make mistakes while you're sharpening, it's a lot more... Um, it's a lot easier to swallow to make a mistake on a set of tools that cost you $100. And if you need to resharpen them and you watch that steel going away on the grinder, um, it's easier to take than if you spend $100 on a tool and you're learning to sharpen that over and over again. Uh, so I always recommend to people to go out and buy an entry level set and start from there. You might find other advice uh, from other people, but that would be the advice that I typically give people here at the club. So this tool here would be um, another example of a spindle gouge. Uh, again, the shallow flute that's on this. This is a much wider tool. Um, it's kind of beat up, been well used, but it sharpens up nice still. 
And uh, this is, is just an example of a spindle gouge that's got a much wider flute and is going to take off a lot more material um, at a time. Try this. this one here would be a uh, spindle roughing gouge. You'll often hear people uh, refer to this tool as just a roughing gouge. I think for that new person, it's very important to always call this a spindle roughing gouge because it's only safe to use when your work is in that spindle orientation. Um, you do not want to try to use this in a bowl gouge. And the reason is when you're uh, using this in a bowl or if you're using this on what we refer to as a face grain or cross grain, uh, these tips that are out here on the profile are, are uh, going to give you a catch, probably a nasty catch. You're going to gouge the wood. The other problem with this tool is the way that they manufacture it. This tang right here that goes down into the wood is uh, very thin and uh, somewhat fragile. And as long as you have um, the uh, tool against the rest and you're close to it, you're probably going to be okay. But if you get this tool out over the rest at all or you, you get that catch in the side grain, you're going to snap this off. Uh, if you look online, you'll find people posting uh, photos all the time, you know, saying, what did I do wrong because their tool snapped on them. And that's why is because they're using the wrong tool um, unsafely in the wrong orientation. So if we were to look at a bowl gouge just to further um, put that point home, this bowl gouge has, um, you know, a half inch steel round shank going all the way down back into the tool handle. And it's, it's a much more durable tool. And you don't see people snapping their bowl gouge or bending their bowl gouge online as long as they're using it correctly. Uh, we took a look at a parting tool that was much thinner. This one is an example of a parting tool that's got a thicker profile. This is probably what's going to be in that kit that you buy for your beginner set. It's going to be a thicker parting tool. A thin parting tool certainly takes off um, waste less wood and it uh, probably will cut through that wood quicker, but it's also very fragile and if you're not careful with it, you can bend that thin parting tool. I would recommend starting with a thicker one like this for a new person. This would be um, another example of a scraper. Uh, we looked at a round nose scraper earlier. This scraper was, uh, I guess, typically is referred to as a bedan, and it's a flat, uh, flat scraper across the edge. Uh, this one has been reprofiled with uh, relief on the side so that you can get down in the bottom of like a lidded box, and it kind of cuts uh, into the side and the bottom at the same time as you're going down. Uh, so this one was a, a flat scraper that you probably would get in an entry-level kit, and it's just been reshaped a little bit. Uh, there's a little side profile of that. And then uh, the last thing, and this is a tool that a lot of new people will struggle with. Uh, you, you can learn to love or hate it. It's a very versatile tool, though. It's a skew chisel, and uh, these will come in a variety of sizes, uh, but you do get a super good finish if you know how to use a, a skew chisel, and it's something that you really should learn uh, to use as a wood turner. Another thing that you uh, need to consider is how you're going to store your tools. Um, it's important to protect that uh, sharp tip that you put on that tool. So um, some people will create a rack to store those on the wall in their shop. Some people create uh, a method to store it above their lathe. If you're going to be working in the same shop all the time, you'll come up with your own um, method to have, it, have your tools close at hand. If you're going to travel with your tools to say go to a, your local wood turners club or to take them out publicly for demonstration, if you buy yourself a, uh, a roll like uh, this, this will store your tools um, with the tips protected and then you basically it rolls up and then you put it in your kit and uh, take it out. So I would recommend if you're going to um, travel with something uh, or go to your club frequently like a lot of our members do here that you purchase something like this and uh, protect those tips. I think earlier in the video I mentioned one of those uh, 
carbide tips I had was banged up uh, from bouncing around in my uh, tool drawer. And so I rectified that with some uh, PVC pipes that I use for storage now so that they're not banging into each other. Another little tip that we have uh, here at the club is uh, I'm not even sure where we picked these up from, but a member donated quite a bit of this plastic material here. And we're basically giving it away um, at our meetings, but it's pretty handy as you can see. Um, it's pretty handy, a uh, little thing to just slip over the tip of your tool and then uh, protect it if you need to transport them or you don't have a way to uh, separate them. When I carry mine uh, in my tool bag, I'll typically um, slip a piece of something like this over there. I'd like to tell you where to get it, but I, I have no idea. It's just something that our club uses and uh, it's been pretty handy for us. Uh, a decision that you're going to have to make at some point when you're buying your, your tools, uh, maybe after you step away from that initial set and you start buying uh, your forever tools, if you will, or the tools that you plan to use long term, is whether you're going to buy them um, handled or unhandled. And that's totally up to you uh, how you want to do that. In a few minutes here, I'm going to show you examples of different handle systems if you buy an unhandled tool. But um, with that uh, handled system, it's ready to go out of the box. Um, if you were to buy, say, a bowl gouge like this with the handle on it, this is an M2 steel tool. It's probably going to cost you $50 to $70, I don't know, somewhere in that range. Um, if you buy the unhandled tool, like this uh, bottom feeder here, or this 5 8 bowl gouge next to it. These are M42 steel, so obviously they're more expensive. Um, these are gonna be about $100 um, each just for the steel. And then you're gonna have the additional cost of a handle if you use a handle system or to make a handle. So that's something to consider, I'm not telling you which is right or wrong by the time you want to uh, move on to those more expensive tools, you're gonna have to make that decision for yourself. Uh, but by then you should have a little bit of experience and a little bit of uh, uh, educated guessing that you can do on your own, I guess. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, if you were gonna buy your tools unhandled, uh, at some point, you're either going to have to make handles for your tools or you're going to invest in a handle system that you like. Uh, just about every manufacturer that makes unhandled tools also offers a type of handle for their tool, but that doesn't mean you have to use their handle. You can pretty much uh, inter-swap what you want uh, just as soon as you find what's to your liking. Uh, this is an example of three different brands of uh, tools or uh, tool handle accessories, I guess, because this last one here is actually just the end piece that you buy separately. Um, this is not intended to be an endorsement of any of these tools. There's a variety of, of handles out there and handle manufacturers. This just happens to be the ones that we have present, kind of like what we mentioned in our lathe demonstration. It just happens to be what's in the shop. You find what works best for you. So kind of from, uh, um, across the board here we'll start off with uh, this is a Thompson tool handle if you buy a handle from Doug Thompson then uh, you have the option to have your name embossed on the handle which is kind of a nice uh, little feature the next one over is um, bought from Woodworkers Emporium out in um, Las Vegas Nevada uh, these handles are left over from the Stuart uh, Batty uh, collection and then the uh, tops that are on here are actually made by a robust tool and you can buy this handle stock from Woodworkers Emporium with or without that uh, collet system or uh, robust system on the top. And then the last one over here is just a piece of cherry that was turned um, into a handle and you buy this um, particular piece separately and uh, that varies according to the diameter of the wood. So I'll give you a little bit of a close-up here of, of each one of these. This is the Thompson tool handle. Um, 
these, as we mentioned earlier, with the powdered metal tools is what Doug, Doug Thompson makes. It's a really quality uh, piece of tool, and his handles are pretty uh, stout also. Uh, for features here, these have a uh, set screw to secure the handle in there, um, and they are made out of aluminum. And they have another nice feature here that if you wanted to put some, some ballast like sand or lead shot to absorb oh, vibration, I didn't realize you'd done that, Jerry. My fault. Uh, if, <laughs> if you want to put something in there, such as this shot, then uh, that helps with uh, vibration dampening, and that's a nice, nice feature that comes with that tool. As I, as I mentioned, um, these tools here were bought out at Woodworkers Emporium in Las Vegas. They sell these online or in their store. They can make these uh, tool handles, uh, I think, up to like three feet long or as short as 10 inches. It's your choice. They sell them with or without this collet system on the end. This system here is uh, developed by Robust Tools. Um, I like it. Um, some people might prefer something a little, little more simple. But with this co uh, collet system, it's, um, it comes in an ER25 or an ER32. That's like a machinist industry standard. You can find the collet pieces um, in those size ranges from a variety of places. Um, this particular ER25 handle will handle uh, with the collet system can go as far down as a quarter inch diameter tool up to a 5 8 This other setup here is a uh, ER32 and it can handle up to a 3 quarter inch diameter tool all the way down to a 3 8 diameter. So my initial purchase of one of these handles, I bought the ER25 because I didn't have any tools that were at that time over 5 8 inch in diameter and now I have several that are 3 quarter inch in diameter so I have I own both systems now but within this uh, particular setup here if you remove the uh, top which you normally wouldn't do um, you end up with this collet inside and these come as I mentioned in a variety of sizes and when you order the tool handles, you order them with or without the collets. Once you've purchased the collets um, one time, you really could use them across all the different handles, so you only need one set. This is kind of an expensive handle system, whereas the Doug Thompson handle that I showed you was about um, $60. Um, this one is going to run you about $110 for the handle with the... Um, machine piece at the top and then it's going to be um, if you want the set of collets with it it's going to be about 143 dollars per handle so as you could see when we had um, if you you know have three or four of these laid out on the table as we were looking at uh, you have a significant investment of you know 400 dollars or so just in handles so it's not something i you have to have to start off with but uh, to upgrade to a handle system like that uh, might be something you want to do at some point. I don't know if I mentioned it, but those handles are actually made out of carbon fiber, which does a super job with uh, vibration dampening, and it's a super strong material. So this last one that we're going to look at here is another um, system. This one, as you can see uh, from the end there, is made by Jimmy Clues. This little piece is made out of aluminum, and it... Uh, basically costs I think around $50. The problem with this handle system in my opinion is it's only good for one size of tool. This one fits a half inch and he has them color coded but you basically have to have a different, different handle because this is epoxied into the wood so you have to have a different handle for um, each size of tool that you're using. If you have a half inch tool it's one size 5 8 and it's a whole different handle. Again, at $50 a pop, that's still probably cheaper than the other option that I showed you. It's just, it comes down to personal preference. This is, it's a quality made uh, piece of equipment, I will say that. Okay, 
So you might ask yourself, why do I want to buy a non-handled tool or what's the advantage of buying a non-handled tool? Well, particularly as your uh, tool gets longer, the longer tool handle sometimes for the deeper uh, work that you're doing, you might want a longer handle. Or if you were to have a tool handle that let's, let's say is, is as long as this one, which that's a one that, I, that was made. It's not something you would buy that long. But when you're sharpening those tools and standing in front of the grinder with the grinding jig like we uh, show in our sharpening series, you basically, as you're turning that, you have to be able to get back out of the way to get that sweep going on uh, to get that, that tool sharpened properly. Uh, whereas if, if you have a non-handled tool and you, you take it out of the handle and put it in that jig, you're not doing that dance around the grinder. It's much easier to just stand there and uh, sharpen that tool. Um, as I mentioned, typically also when you buy that non-handled tool, it's going to be a, a higher quality of steel. And if you already have a handle system that you like, it is a way to save a little bit of money when you're buying the actual tool steel. So again, it's a personal preference whether you want to buy those tools handled or unhandled. You can buy any one of the types of metals that we talked about today. You can find a manufacturer that makes it with or without a handle.